Well, good evening. evening. Y'all doing all right tonight? Yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Do what? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't uh, thank her. She's the one that's put up with me for 20 years. All right. So we are currently going through the book of Genesis, going through the book of Genesis here on Wednesday nights. And so that's what we're doing. The last time we were together, we really only addressed about eight verses. We didn't get very far at all. It was such a, uh, a deep thing to try to figure out exactly why God was going to destroy the earth and all the life that's there in it. Uh, it's not a small topic. Again, I'm uh, I still uh, mentioned the last time, and I'll mention it again today. I, it, it always cracks me up when I see um, Noah's Ark in almost every little uh, nursery and every little preschool area. Um, the truth is, it was a horrific and tragic event. Um, and so, I, I, like I said last time, I sort of expect on the next wall over to be the stoning of Stephen and everybody else. I mean, it, it's just it, but. We, we picture it different in our minds, but we have to understand that this truly was a terrible, terrible event and countless lives. We'll never know how many lives were lost inside this event. And so getting an understanding, a good grip on it is why we took so much time. And so we're going to move quickly now um, as we jump into the flood. Probably this week and next week thereafter, we're probably going to take a couple chapters at a time because it's just dealing with that flood itself. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up where we left off last time there in verse 9 of Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And like last time, I'll read a little bit and we'll talk about it and I'll read a little bit more and talk about that. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. And Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. We'll stop there for a second and talk a little bit before we continue on. Uh, first thing is, is like we said last week, we discussed all the stuff that about how terrible it was, and we 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 were really bad about making our generation out to be bad. Okay, um, I think I mentioned this last week that man, I, I know that when I go and I sat at my grandparents' house, or I'll sit at my dad's house, or even I, I've got to watch myself. I'll be watching the news and think, man, it's terrible. I've never seen it so bad. Oh, it's horrible. And all that wonder stuff, doom and gloom. And the truth is, no, it's been far worse. Uh, it's been far worse in American history. I was read a book not too long ago on uh, what happened before the first Great Awakening, and it, America was in a horrible place with crime happening constantly. Uh, the difference now is we just have news being thrown at us constantly with all the horrible stuff uh, and not aware of how bad it's always been. But at this point, the earth could not be any worse. He do sort of doubles down on it here in our passage. But before I jump into that, um, I was actually asked a really good question that I felt like I probably need to address. If it was asked to me uh, in private, it probably could be something I could add or let you all know. Somebody asked me a question. Uh, when it says here that Noah was found righteous and blameless, does that mean all his other family members are dead? Uh, remember, there's two lineages that were just presented to us in earlier chapters. You had the lineage of Cain, and it goes through multiple generations uh, following Cain, and then multiple generations following Seth. And so it's a good question. What about Noah's daddy? What about Noah's granddaddy? Uh, I mean, his granddaddy was Methuselah. Um, and so his great-granddaddy, we know, wasn't there with us anymore. That was Enoch, and y'all remember what happened to him. He was just no more. Uh, God just took him uh, because he walked with God. There was only two mentioned that walked with God, Enoch and his great-grandson, Noah. But what about all the other ones that were in that lineage? And something that you need to remember that's said in, in that lineage is that it was, say, Methuselah. 
and it would mention Methuselah's son, Lamech. But it would also say Methuselah had what? Many other sons and daughters. The, the generations only mentioned one, the most knowable person of that generation. Not all of them were get listed out. And so there were many, again, Methuselah lived 900 something years. He had a lot of kids. Uh, it wasn't just Lamech, he had a lot. But only one got mentioned. And the same goes with Lamech, Noah's father. He too had many sons and many daughters. So that means Noah would have had many siblings. Many of them. We don't even have a clue how many he had, but he definitely had siblings. And were they alive at the time of the flood? The odds are, yeah. The only one that we know that probably was not alive at the time was his grandfather, Methuselah. And the reason why we don't know, we believe that he wasn't alive at the time of the flood is because what his name actually means. Methuselah means when he is dead, it shall be sent. When he's dead, it shall be sent. And so most people believe that that's talking about the flood. That when Methuselah dies, here comes the flood. So most people believe that Methuselah either died the year of the flood or the day before the flood or whatever. But he died before the flood. As far as we know about his father, Lamech, or all his siblings, they were alive. And so what does that tell us? Noah was the best of them. That's it. Here's the thing, I, I've got a lot of family members and some of my family members I believe are far greater in faith than I am. And some of my family members, I don't know if they believe at all. And I know some of you have family members the same way. And the truth is when God looked over the earth, he found one that was blameless. Among all Noah's brothers and all of Noah's sisters, all of Noah's first, second, third, fourth, fifth cousins of everybody, he found one man that truly sought after him. One man that desired to do what God wanted him to do. And that may very well have included his father, Lamech. It was just that Lamech was the most prominent of the sons of Methuselah, in particular because he had a really famous son named Noah. And so that is why they are mentioned. But the truth is, he would have had many people of his own family that would have died there in the flood. He just happened to be the most faithful. That's what the scripture tells us in verse 9. He was a righteous man. He was blameless. What? At this time. All right. Well, let me ask this question. Did y'all see that phrase, at this time? All right. What is this time? How is the world doing at this time? Anybody want to ask that? Anybody know the answer to that question? It ain't good. Uh, it actually said that every thought and intention of the people's heart were what? Evil. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that Noah really wasn't that good of a guy. No, I believe he really was. If it says he walked with God, that's a big thing. That's a big indicator. But the truth is his generation was terrible. Okay. Uh, it really was a terrible generation. But he was the most faithful man at that time. Not of all time, but at that time, Noah walked with God. It goes on to tell us that he has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're going to talk more about the sons of Noah as we continue on through the story of Noah. If, if anybody, and I'm sure most of you have studied through Genesis at some point, or at least read through Genesis, it usually focuses in on one person at a time. We're going to go through the story and the life of Noah, and when we get to the end of Noah, we're going to talk a lot more about his sons and what his sons do and all that good stuff. So I'm not going to dive into who Shem, Ham, and Japheth are. We'll do that a little bit later as we go on. But what I will point out to you is this. Noah lived 600 years, we know. By the time the flood hits, he is 600 years old. How many kids did Noah have? Three. Now, every other person in that lineage that we just read a couple chapters ago, the lineage of Seth, it would say Methuselah had Lamech and at this day and age of his life, and then he would have many other sons and daughters. And then Lamech would be so old when he had Noah, and he would have many other sons and daughters. When it comes to Noah, it says he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's it. 600 years. You also need to realize that in this culture and time, what was considered wealth at that time? To have a large family. 
Today, they're still, even though our culture is shifting a lot, we still see children as what? A blessing. Now, God, Noah walked with God. Noah was a faithful man. He was the most righteous man of his generation. But would his neighbors have considered him blessed by just looking at his offspring? Probably not. Because the dude lived 600 years. And all he had was three kids in 600 years? The reason I'm making that point is this. Do not believe what you will hear on TVs uh, through preachers or evangelists on that or anybody else that will tell you that God always blesses you the way the world sees blessings. The way the world sees blessings, no doubt at this time, is the more kids you have, the more blessed you were. But the truth is, Noah was a very righteous man. Noah walked with God, but how many did he end up having? Just three in 600 years. Don't allow the world to tell you what blessings really are. Don't allow the world to tell you that you must not be walking too closely with God if you're not having X, Y, and Z in your life. Don't listen to that. You focus on Christ, you focus on growing yourself and understand that Noah probably recognized something that Jesus taught us a long time ago or mentioned a long time ago that we still try to teach people today. Where's your treasure supposed to be? In heaven, where the rest and the moth do not gather. It's not always here on this earth. So if you're ever sitting around and you're listening to a preacher that tells you that God can't wait to give you a million dollars in the bank, you need to turn that t preacher off. Because uh, he's missed the point. And uh, there's a lot of people in this world that have absolutely missed the point. And let me tell you something else. It goes the same way when it comes to health and everything else. It, it, that, it's called health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. The truth is there are many people, and, I, and, and I've mentioned this before. You go to the great heroes of faith, and Noah is in Hebrews 11. The mentioning of the great heroes of faith, Noah is one of them. And the truth is, many of those people, the great heroes of faith, died. They had their heads cut off. And if you listen to some of these prosperity gospels, they'll tell you that, well, they must have not had enough faith. God didn't save them. Well, he did save some of them. He got Daniel out of the lion's den, but not all of them got taken out of that lion's den. Some of them got eaten or eaten. I guess that's the proper way of saying that. So don't allow the world to tell you what blessings are. Noah had three kids, but yet he walked with God, and he truly was a righteous man, blameless. Something else that we'll see in this passage before we move on is where he starts describing the earth again. He did it earlier in chapter 6, and he sort of re-hits it again there in verses 11 and 12. And one thing you need to note is every time the Bible repeats a word, it's important. And if you look at verse 11 and verse 12, there's one word that's repeated three times in just two verses. And that word is corrupt. The earth was corrupt. Mankind was corrupt. And the only way that I can really explain this to you to help you to understand what sin has truly done is to sort of put it in a modern understanding. If I was to get an email... Okay, um, and God bless Brother Steve. I, I probably bug him to death, and so does everybody else about emails and our email systems here at the church. But if I get an email that says potential corrupted files, Brother Steve, should I open that file? No, because what's going to happen? It's a bad thing. If you got something that's a corrupted file and you open it up on your computer, your computer may be working wonderful. It may be the greatest computer in the world, but you open that corrupted file, all of a sudden a virus is coming up out of that thing, and it is going to destroy your computer. Your computer will not work properly. The earth was corrupt. He mentions it three times that humanity was corrupt. What he made was originally good. It was perfect. Everything was great. But sin was a corrupted file that got opened up in us. And guess what? By this time, every thought, everything we did was bad. The only way to fix a corrupted computer is to do what, Brother Steve? Start over. What does God do to the earth? got to start it over. You're going to have to wipe the hard drive and start all over. 
And that's exactly what he's going to do here. Why? Because the corruption has gotten too bad. It's far beyond corrupt. And so it's mentioned three times there that it was corrupt. Another word that you see there is it was mentioned that it was filled with violence. I, I shouldn't have to explain this, but I find that I do have to explain this pretty often. That when you remove God, guess what the, the, uh, the product is going to be every time? Violence. When God gets removed, violence is going to happen. Now, that is argued a lot when it comes into our culture. They'll say, even with God, there's violence. And you know what? They're absolutely correct. Even for those that have God in their life or profess God, they do do violent things. But it isn't because of their faith or because that's what God wants. It's because of the corruption of their own heart and sin. They'll point to things such as the Crusades or the Inquisition uh, during the Great Reformation, the Spanish Inquisition being the primary one, they'll point to those events and say, see, that's what Christianity will give you or what faith will give you. And I'll tell you, absolutely not. That, has, that, that is not what Christianity will give you. You, you. you have to be a student of history, and I, I have to correct people on this all the time. What a lot of people don't realize that before the Crusades ever took place it was about the time that Islam really got started. And the Muslims began to walk up into Europe. And if you look over history, for about a century, the Muslims kept taking over one country after another. They got all of North Africa. They got all the way through Spain. They even got into France and everything else. And they were taking everything over and forcing everyone to convert to Islam. Well, all the European kings decided, you know what? We got to get these people out of here. We got to fight against them. So what are we going to do? How do you rally people to fight? Well, they invoke the name of God. And so that's how you get people to join your army. But the truth is they wanted power. They wanted money. They wanted more authority. And so it's the sin behind it that caused the crusades, not God. It's the sin behind it. And then same with the Inquisition. It's nothing more than the Catholics had already had so much power that they wanted to keep their power, so they fought against the Reformation and caused the Inquisition. But here's the point. The point is, if you remove God, you see violence as the answer. I'll give you an example that I use most often. When it comes to Karl Marx, Karl Marx was really changed by Darwin's theory of evolution. Karl Marx uh, had great influence on one man uh, named Hitler. Okay? Hitler believed what? That... The primary, most powerful race was a white person with blonde hair and blue eyes. Okay, where did he get that? From Karl Marx. And Karl Marx got it from Darwin because of evolution, that you slowly but surely could uh, be one certain species could be greater than another species or a part of the species. And so that led to Hitler doing what he did. And then you can go into other atrocities, such as Russia with Stalin, China with Mao, or even the Cambodia killing fields, Pol Pot. Every one of them uh, completely tried to destroy religion as it was in their countries and for the most part were pretty successful at doing it and so you begin to remove god violence is just a part of it and as our country becomes further and further away from god with any chances of there being a judgment or even mentioning of judgment you see more and more murder and does anybody have a clue what the number one uh, killing thing is in the United States. The number one thing killing human beings today in the United States. There it is. It isn't alcohol. It isn't driving. It isn't plane crashes. It isn't any of that stuff. Abortion is the number one killer today. Um, and so it shouldn't shock you. It's like something I shared on Facebook uh, about a month ago. Uh, in Maryland, they're trying to pass a law that now you can end the life of a child even six months after birth. Um, and why, and it's like I put on Facebook that, that makes perfect sense when you understand their logic. I mean, if you can deny the human life inside the womb, why do you have to, why can you not deny it outside the womb? I mean, that's just the point. But when you begin to lose the absence of God, 
it doesn't really matter. Violence is just a part of the society, and violence is what you find here in this society. It was utterly corrupt and filled with violence toward one another. Moving on, we're going to pick up in verse 13, and we're going to go to the end, verse 22 of chapter 6. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you should make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, and the breadth, 50 cubits, and the height, 30 cubits. And you shall make the window for the ark and finish it to the cubit from the top and set the door on the ark and the side of it. And you shall make it with a lower, a second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing a flood uh, of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, and you and your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark, and keep them alive with you. And they shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, and of the creeping thing, or the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you... Take for yourself some of all the food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. All right. First off, looking here, God gives Noah instructions, and he gives him instructions on how to build the ark, and it's pretty specific on how to do it. And one of the things that I like about this is you're beginning to see something that we already know in the New Testament, especially if you've read through the Old Testament. Our God is not a God of chaos, all right? He's not willy-nilly. He doesn't say, oh, I need you to build a boat, and man, just build it however you want. That's not how God works. God is a God of order. He's a God of structure. He does it in a certain way, and he expects us to do it the way he tells us to do it. Even whether we understand it or not, it doesn't matter. Do it the way he says. Uh, for example, you'll see when it comes to the tabernacle. Uh, Brother Stedman did a great study a few uh, months ago on the tabernacle, and it is in order. It was structured. It had to be done a certain way, made of specific materials, because every bit of it was going to point to something. Uh, the tabernacle was that way. The church is that way. It is structured. Well, in my D group, we're going through uh, 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, he's having to get on to the Corinthian church because it's a madhouse. you got people speaking out of turn, people speaking in tongues whenever they felt like it, prophesying whenever they felt like it. And he's like, y'all got to stop. You, you're going to have to do this in order. You're going to speak one at a time, and you're only going to do two of you speaking in tongues, and only this way, and he got to have it in order. First Timothy, we went through it here on Sunday mornings, and what does he teach us in First Timothy? That the church is to be what? Structured and in order. There's only certain positions, and of those positions, this is the qualification for this position, the qualifications for that position. If you're, you've got to have widows, how are you going to take care of the widow? Who is the widow indeed? Uh, not everybody fits the category. He puts structure to the church on how all of it operates because we serve a God of order, and that's what he is getting to here. He is telling Noah, man, it's got to be built to this specific way, and you've got to do this that. I mentioned it just this past Sunday on Sunday morning, uh, a, a case in point that we need to take it serious when God tells us to do something and to do it the way he tells us to do it, not the way that we want to do it. Because our natural inkling is to do what? Do it our way. You know, we, we get really laxed sometimes about doing things that God has told us to do, and we just sort of do it our way. And we, we twist it our way, and we cannot do that. we got to do it his way. And the story that I gave you is when David wanted to build the temple in Jerusalem, and he was going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. 
And what he does in that story is he takes the ark and he puts it on a cart, and that cart's pulled by an ox, and everybody's having a party. Everybody's excited because the ark of the covenant's coming back. The ox hit a bump in the road. The ark of the covenant shifted and was about to fall off the cart when a man caught the ark to try to keep it from falling off. That sounds like a good thing, right? The only problem is God killed the man on the spot. And why did he kill him? Because, number one, he shouldn't have touched the ark. You're not supposed to. The second reason why is they weren't supposed to be moving the ark in that way in the first place. And so David's heart's upset. Everybody's upset. They're all scared to death now of the ark of the covenant, which is a good thing. Because now what do they do when they're fearful? They go back and they read, why did this happen? Well, God said it had to be carried by priests, and it had to be done by a certain pole at a certain length, and so many priests, and all this with horns before and all of it. And so when they realize the way they're supposed to do it, they now bring the ark in the proper way, and everybody has a celebration, and God's happy. He is a God of order. Do not lose reverence. And that is one of the reasons why we, I mentioned that when it was in context to Ananias and Sapphira, we get to the point we sort of lose reverence for God, do we not? We no longer have reverence for him. We just sort of do it our way. We don't think about it anymore. We don't give him a second thought most of the time. And the truth is he's told us how to do these things. And if we think that God doesn't care, we need to be reminded of these stories. That's why you have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. That's why you have the story of the man who touched the Ark of the Covenant and the sons of Aaron that got that used strange fire and were burned up. And so these stories are there for a purpose and a reason to remind us that we have a God of order and he expects us to do it his way. Something else that you need to see here is in verse 17. Uh, it's important to note right there in the beginning. Do you, I want you to read the beginning of verse 17, just the beginning of it. Yes, sir, 617. That's good. That's good. All right. What it is, is who is bringing the flood? Like my translation says, behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood. Who's bringing the flood? God is. One of the things that amazes me, and, it, and it, it, it's really growing in our culture, and in fact, even when I was in Bible college, one of the guys that I was in Bible college with was sort of getting caught up into it. We, we live in a culture and day and age where God is a God of love, and he is a God of love, but as we further move into that, and again, it's like a pendulum that swings, they begin to remove all wrath and all judgment from God. In fact, there are many churches that will never mention God's wrath. They will not mention God's judgment at all, and they rarely mention sin, much less repentance. Uh, and they just don't talk about it anymore. And it happened even when I was in Bible college, it got mentioned, to where the, the old guy was starting to twist every story saying that it really wasn't God that did it. it. You know, when David went and killed so many people, that was just David acting in his flesh. It wasn't God doing all that and stuff. And so I had to debate him many times. And when I would debate him, I would remind him that God did, in fact, kill several people. Uh, you can go through the Old Testament. It, I mean, he would open up the ground pretty often and swallow people up. Um, he, he would burn them. He, he, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, they, when they messed up, God would punish them. But the one that I really always would get him on was this, because he would try to twist all of them. This is one of them, Noah's flood. Uh, but the second one that I would get him the best on was the plagues of Egypt. Do you all remember what the last plague of Egypt was? Anybody? The firstborns would die. And that event was to be remembered, and we call it what? Passover. Because the death angel would pass over the Israelites who would put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the mantle, okay? And it was that covenant meal that Jesus Christ took and changed the covenant for us. 
and said, during this covenant meal, I'm making a new covenant with you. That's something that we participated in on Sunday morning when we partook of the Lord's Supper. That's the Passover meal. And so you can't tell me that God never once killed anybody because the very Passover meal that Jesus Christ established his covenant with us, it was in remembrance of him destroying the firstborn of all of Egypt because of the sins that they had committed against him and to his people. And the reason why I'm bringing up that is simply this. Do not get caught up in our culture today that teaches that God doesn't have wrath, that God doesn't do that. He doesn't put judgment on them. That's a lie that goes all the way back to Genesis. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 that we've already discussed. When Eve said, when Satan said to eat of the fruit, and Eve says, no, we can't do it, we can't even touch it, or we'll surely die, what does Satan then respond? You shall not surely die. He takes away the judgment. And we live in a world today that there are many professing Christians and definitely in our world that non-professing Christians will tell you that God does not judge. There is no hell. None of it. And the truth there is. Um, that's why Christ had to die to begin with. I tell everyone the reason why I know God loves me and the reason why I know he's a God of love and a God of grace is because of what he did to Christ on that, crown, on that cross. It's on the cross of Calvary that you see the wrath of God, but you also see the love and the grace of God. The wages of sin is death, but God loved us so much, he took that wages upon himself. And so you see God's love and God's grace, but you also see his wrath and his judgment. And so here in verse 17, behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood. We see God's wrath and his judgment going against sin. Something else I want you to see here is, y'all, this ark was huge, all right? I don't know if you know what a cubit is, but it's okay because I had to look it up too. It was huge, and I don't have to really explain to you how big it is because all you got to do is get on your phone and Google ark, and it will probably take you to the ark that's built right here in the United States. Uh, you can go to the border of Kentucky and right there below the city of Cincinnati, and you will find the ark. The Creation Museum, Ken Ham, has built this thing. He has done a replica of the ark. Has anybody been to the ark? Okay, several of you. Can one of you tell me, was the ark big or small? Huge. Huge. This thing is monstrous. Uh, and so, yes, it, it, it's an unbelievable task. There's a reason why God gave him 120 years. And, but even with 120 years, it still took some miracle, all right? Because they didn't have cranes. They didn't have all the kind of stuff and tools that we had. And so this was an unbelievable ship, according to the measurements that are given here. It's just mind-blowing how big it is. But people will still argue, well, it wasn't big enough to hold all the life in the world. Okay, well, it is. And again, I, I don't have to go into too great a detail because Ken Ham and the Creation Museum, they've done a great job of explaining it. But one thing I will point out to you is what it says right here in this passage, because we're going through it right now. You see the introduction of the word kind again. We talked about this back in Genesis chapter 1. When God would create an animal, he did it by its kind. And so what I'm saying is this. If you think, like some people, the, those that scoff and mock the idea of the ark, uh, of the, the ark itself and all the animals getting on it, They'll tell you there's no way that all these animals can get on that ark. And I tell you, it is possible when you put them in their kinds. And what, uh, an example is this. Anybody have a chihuahua? Do you really? God, I was going to talk bad about chihuahuas, but I'm not going to since you're here. But they, they, there's all kinds of dogs. You got chihuahuas, which I call ankle biters, because I've only been bit by two dogs in my life, and one of the worst one was a chihuahua. I ate me up, and the other one was a Rottweiler, but that's another story. And so, uh, but anyway, the dogs come from chihuahuas to Rottweilers to bull mastiffs to St. Bernard's 
to German shepherds or like what I have, an Australian shepherd, or like my daughter has, a shizu, okay? Which is nothing but a hair of flesh that sits around and does nothing but barks and eats and poops, all right? No functionality whatsoever other than I guess it makes her feel good, all right? But you've got all the, and so, yeah, if you think that all these breeds got on that ark, then you're right, there ain't enough room. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says one of each kind. So a male and female canine got put on that ark, a dog. Now, all these little breeds came afterwards. In fact, y'all do realize that all dogs come from basically wolves, right? Or a form of a wolf. Mankind has just selectively bred them down into whatever they can. I mean, they got some now that are like this. I don't even know why you need a dog that small. I guess I, I do know why. Puppies are the cutest things there ever was. And so they just made a dog that stays a permanent puppy. And so that, that's what he's talking about, kinds. And so when it comes to horses, yeah, you, you've got multiple different types of horses. But it's a male and female horse. The, don't get lost in all these breeds. And so when you really start to condense all the animal kingdom down to one, now it's starting to make sense. Now you're starting to understand that, yes, they were capable of getting all on that ark. Let's see here two yeah I'll get to that in just a second all right something else that I want you to see here uh, is there at the end it says thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him so he did and so it's a double emphatic so he did it just as it said earlier I even I am bringing a flood it's a double emphatic on how Noah did exactly what God told him to do have you ever really thought about what God told him to do 120 years. Man, most of us get upset when God asks us to teach a Sunday school class for a year. 120 years he spent building that boat. And was that easy work? Has anybody ever built a boat? Y'all, I can't even hardly build anything. I, I sat there and watched wonderful men come over to my house to build a greenhouse. And, and Russ, how'd that turn out? Was that the easiest thing there was? The, the, the greenhouse? It was, yeah, I mean, let's be real. How did Dennis end up? <laughs> you know, he fell off the ladder. And I mean, it, it was tough. We had to get all kinds of things. And that's a greenhouse. Yo, this is a monstrous ark. Was this an easy job? Heck, no, it wasn't an easy job, especially when you understand what else he had to do. It wasn't that he just had to build that ark. He had to gather all the food. He had to get all of it, all of this together. And on top of it, Noah preached. He preached on top of it. How do I know that's in 2 Peter? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It says, and if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. And so Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He's not only building an ark, but I wonder how many people walked by and said, would you look at that fool? You know, how, at this point, has it ever rained in Scripture? Never. Do they need a boat? No, they don't need a boat. He's building this mine, and they probably thought he was the biggest idiot there ever was. And it's like, why in the world are you building this thing? And he's declaring to them, God's going to send a flood. And they're like, what's a flood? They laughed at him. They mocked him, just as they mock us today. When we say that the world will be destroyed, the world will be judged, they mock us. That doesn't make any sense. And notice how many people believed him. Anybody got a number? Seven. Eight, including him. Seven people believed what he had to say after 120 years of preaching righteousness, 120 years of building this. And let me ask you this question. We've already, I hinted at it earlier. Did Noah have any family? Yeah, he did too. He had many brothers 
and many sisters. The odds are Lamech is probably still alive as dad. How many of his brothers made it on the ship? How many of his sisters, his cousins, his nieces, his nephews, his neighbor down the street, his co-workers? How many of them made it? None of them. Not one person believed what he had to say. None of them listened to him. And that's something that sometimes really bothers me, and I have to watch it. Because, man, I'll get done with a sermon on Sunday morning, and when nobody moves, you know what I think? Ooh, what a waste of time. Well, why did I do that? Maybe I missed the point. But, you know, I, I, I read this in a commentary that made this point. Do you know Noah is probably sitting after 120 years of preaching, only his own, his, just his three sons, his three daughter-in-laws and wife believed him. Nobody else really believed him. He probably had a right to have a pity party, except one person. One person in the heavens looks at him and said, Psh, he had it easy. You know who that was? Jeremiah. How many people believe Jeremiah? Not a soul believed Jeremiah. That's why they call him the weeping prophet. He wept over Jerusalem night and day, and not one person believed him that Babylon was coming, and they're going to destroy him. Not one person ever believed what Jeremiah had to say. And the truth is, people may not believe you either. Your brothers and your sisters may not believe you. Understand that Christ did say he was coming with a sword, and he would separate families at times. I have family members that love me, and I love them, but the truth is they think I'm nuts. I have one stepsister that is a devout atheist, and I have family members that may say they're Christian, but they hadn't darkened the door of a church in decades, <coughs> and they don't live it. And they, they, they've sort of fallen away of what I said earlier, that God is a God of love and he, everything's fine. And they've missed the point. They've missed the point of the whole thing. Only seven believe, so don't get lost in that. And they didn't believe Noah either. But was Noah a blameless man? Was Noah a righteous man? Did he walk with God? Absolutely. And so the truth is, you could be doing right and living right and sharing the gospel and doing what God commands you and not one person ever trust you or believe you. And still be in the will of God. So don't get caught up on that either. Something else, it tells us what it really means to walk with God. What it really means to walk with God. You see that there again at the end of that passage, the double emphatic, he did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Something I want you to, I mentioned it earlier in Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. <clears throat> this is what it says about Noah. Hebrews eleven seven, By faith, Noah, warned by God about the things not yet seen, in reverence. We just talked about reverence this Sunday and just a second ago. In reverence or fear of the Lord, he prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. That's what it says about Noah and the great hall of fame of faith there in Hebrews 11, or the great cloud of witnesses. The point I'm making is this. He believed God, but what else did he do? Y'all, he worked. He did something. It's one thing to be sitting there and say, all right, yeah, God, I got you. Flood's coming. And do nothing. That's not it. He believed God, and he did what? He did all that was commanded him. Everything. That's what it means to walk with God. You want to know why God took Enoch early and what it meant that he walked with God? Because he kept his commandments. He did what he told him to do. He sought after him. He, he had that changed life and actually did it. And the truth is, that's what we're supposed to do. He built an ark for the salvation of his household because he wanted them to be saved. What are you doing for the salvation of your household? You may very well believe in God, but what are you doing? Anything? So many of us get guilty and we get comfortable. We come and we think coming to church and sitting on that nice little padded pew and singing a song every now and then is all God wants you to do. That is not true. 
That is not in the Bible anywhere. In the Bible, we are called to work. We are called to serve one another, love one another, pray for one another, to be actively using our talents and our gifts for the growth of the body, for the spreading of God's kingdom. That's what we're supposed to do. The New Testament puts it this way, that faith without works is what? It is useless. Useless. Had Noah had faith, that God was going to send a flood and didn't build the ark, how good would that have been? It wouldn't have helped a bit. And there's a lot of people that know and believe in God or claim they believe in God, but they do nothing. Y'all, the demons of hell believe. But what do they do any good works for the spreading of the kingdom of God? Absolutely not. They don't keep his commandments. What you want to know, people who actually walk with God are those that actually keep his commandments. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you'll do what? That's what he said. Noah loved God. And so he did everything he told him to do. He didn't look at God and say, are you crazy? Do you know how long it's going to take me to get enough wood to build this thing? That's not what he said. He just did it. He did it by faith. And we're commanded to do the same thing. Jesus says that I am the vine and you are the branches and that we would bear fruit. And in so bearing fruit, we would prove to be what? His disciples. It's, Jesus said you'll know them by their what? Fruits. If we have faith, that faith needs to be shown through action it has to because without it it's dead i could sit at home all day long and say i got faith in christ but if i don't ever do anything just sit there did that life did that faith change me at all no because if we follow him that's what he says if you want to follow after me take up your cross and follow me you got to deny yourself. That's what he told his disciples. It is action. And what something you see Noah do time and time again is he does exactly what he was told. And the truth is we have all been given commandments. One of them is to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I what? Commanded. The commandments are there. It's in the Great Commission. Something that was given to all of us. And so Noah walked with God he did what he was supposed to do, what he was told to do. And the truth is, we need to be doing what we're supposed to do as well. Something else that I, I, I noted down here in this passage is this. It says that Noah was different in his generation. He was different in his generation. Among all of his family and all of that. And I, I, I want to ask you the question, are you different in your family? Could you be singled out? as someone that is blameless that is trying to walk with God? Or are you just going along with the flow of everybody else? Scripture says we're to be light and we're to be salt. Light in a dark world, salt in a dying world. We're to be different. Noah was different. Dare to be different. Don't do what this world tries to get us to do. Just sort of go in the flow. Don't do that. Go against the flow. Be different. Be light and be salt. Moving on, we're going to jump real quick into Genesis chapter 7. Uh, to save time, I'm not really, well, yeah, I need to read some of it to you. All right, Genesis chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. And you shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and a female, and of animals that are not clean to uh, a male and a female. And also the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, and keep the offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Again, ends in verse 5. What does Noah do? Everything God tells him. He doesn't stop. 
He does it. He doesn't question. He is just faithful to do it. That is why he gets singled out, because he's willing to do it. Something I want to mention here, it's seven clean animals. A lot of people get confused, and, and it's easy to get confused, because if you read in Genesis chapter 6, there at the end, it's by twos they come on. But it doesn't mean that all the animals were by two. It's the unclean animals that were only male and female by two. The clean animals, there were seven of them. All right. Y'all, I'm not a math scholar, but I know one thing. Seven, seven ain't, is an odd number. It's not an even number. And if it's male and female, then one of them's going to be left out. Why is that? Anybody want to take a guess why it was seven? One, it's a perfect number. Seven's important in Scripture. But there's a main reason why God does this. Huh? That it's the sacrifice. At the end of this, there's going to be a sacrifice. And so God put on an extra animal. Y'all, what that tells me is this, and no doubt it did Noah as well. You're getting out of this thing. You're going to make it. And in fact, I'm putting extra animals for the sacrifice you're about to give me once I get you through this. And so it's a promise he can hold on to by giving him these extra animals. The clean animals also, because you're going to see that after the flood, they're going to be allowed to eat. I can't wait till we get to that passage because we're all going to say it together. We get to eat steak. All right. And so thank God for bacon. All right. But at this point, we can't eat bacon. We can't eat steak. Notice in the end of that chapter earlier, Noah had to gather food for him and what? All them animals. That means it was salad. That's all he had was salad. It's all everybody ever ate was salad. But after the flood, they're going to be able to eat. So you, they can only eat clean animals. Therefore, they needed more clean animals, okay? And that's how the world's going to fill back up. And so God is already looking beforehand and all of it. You see the waters open up from above and below. This is important. There's never been rain before. At this time, the rain comes. And boy, does it come. All the heavens opens up. And if y'all remember, when I talked about the creation, the, the original creation was a globe. It was a dome. There was, if you look at it, it says there was water in the sky and water below. And so it was like a globe. And what he does here in this passage, this great event, is he just breaks it all up. Every bit of it. So all the oceans of aquifers below the land erupts to the top. And then all the waters in the top of the dome where we have atmosphere now collapses down through the rain on top. And has anybody ever really been in a true, like, flood? Can flood do damage? Oh, hey, when, do y'all remember? I know I'm old enough to remember, and some of you might not be, but I remember. Do y'all remember the tsunami that happened? It was years ago over in the is Indonesian islands. Y'all, the pictures of it, it, it's amazing what water can do. There, nothing can stand up to it when it really comes. And so when you read this passage, you, man, put yourself in the situation. The waters erupt from the bottom, and it collapses from the top, and it's all coming in at once. And it's bad. There is nowhere to go. The only place is the ark. That's your only hope of getting out of this thing is that ark because there is no high ground. The high ground's about to go. Everything is erupting. This is something else that I like to point to. Uh, when I was growing up in school, they, they, anybody ever heard of Pangaea? Pangaea is a, um, a theory that all the continents were once together. And you can pretty much see, if you look at the map, I mean, I'm not a jigsaw person, but it, it's pretty clear all the continents sort of do look like they came together at one point in time. And they call it Pangaea. Well, what in the world would cause all of them to separate? When God opens up the floods from below and the continents shift. This is, this is a global disaster that our world has only seen once. It says that the waters were... 20 foot above the highest of the mountains to where the ark could actually pass over. Y'all, it's more, we can't even imagine. We can't wrap our mind around what this truly was. And so this happens, this horrific event that just changes everything. It's the reason why you still find seashells at the top of the Himalayas. 
Because water once covered it all, everything, and everything was changed. The land masses, the continents, everything. Our whole earth as we know it changed. It gets asked, and I'll answer this question before we stop for the night and jump into some of this other stuff because it's just too good to just push through. I'll answer this question. Everybody always wants to know, what about them dinosaurs? All right. What about Barney? What happens? All right, well, all right, let me answer this question to you. I'm a firm believer that the dinosaurs were on the ark. I'm a firm believer of that. And the reason why is because of the book of Job. The book of Job mentions them. There's two mentioned in the book of Job. They're, they're, one's called the Leviathan, and I forget the name of the other one. Behemoth. Y'all, the, these creatures are mentioned, and one of them had the tail the size of a cedar tree. Can anybody tell me what animal has the tail the size of a cedar tree? I only know of one, and it ain't living today. All right? I, I've seen its bones. That's all I know. And so I'm a firm believer that, yes, they did. They made it on the ark. And they're thinking, well, the ark just ain't big enough. Well, who said it had to be the full-size one? Why couldn't it have been a baby? I mean, you think Noah would have had the sense that you don't put a brontosaurus on that thing? I think he got it. Give him some common sense. And so he could have put an egg on there for all we know. We don't know, but we know that afterwards they're still there. And something else that you need to know is this. They're like, well, if they were on the ark, where are they today? There were several things happened. One, they could have been hunted to extinction. Does extinction happen? Yeah, constantly. Uh, that's why our government won't let you build bridges over most creeks, because they're worried about a little minnow, all right? And so, yeah, extinction could have easily have happened. It's been a long time since the flood. And so they could have hunted them to extinction, or what I personally believe is this. Again, did the earth change at all? Oh, it was a drastic change. In fact, you're going to see men that once lived 900 years, all of a sudden after this event, man's age drops drastically by hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden it gets down to where we're at now. 80 to 100 is a long life. And that's it. So how is it that man's lifeline all of a sudden dwindled after one event? Well, it's because it was a different world. Everything was different. It was highly oxygenated and rich. It was like a greenhouse. They, and so we'll never really know what the original world was like prior to the flood. We just know what it's like after the flood. And so these animals that reached to these monstrous heights probably may not could have reached to such heights or survived in this new world. We don't know. They could have evolved into something else. At least that's what our science books tells us today that they did evolve into something else. And so I, I'm, I'm with you. Again, I, I'm a firm believer in microevolution. Firm believer. You know why I'm a believer in microevolution? Because I see it every day. As we just talked about. You had a wolf, and that wolf now today is a chihuahua <laughs> and a bull mastiff. And don't neither one of them look like that wolf. But all that has only happened in the last few hundred years. But it's still that one kind. There is a microevolution to where kinds can change and evolve. You can have multiple different species of horse, but at the end of the day, it is a horse. It's an Appalachia or a Clydesdale. At the end of the day, it's still a horse. And it could be a Chihuahua, it could be a Bull Mastiff or a Great Dane, but at the end of the day, it's still a canine. It's a dog. It's of its kind. There could be changes in kinds, but what you don't ever see in the fossils or in history is a dog becoming a cow. <laughs> it don't happen. The, you don't see it branching over of the kinds. You see what I'm talking about? And so that's called evolution, the branching over of kinds. Microevolution is the differentiating of species, which we see every day. I've got three of them living in my house. A cat and two dogs. Because that ain't the original cat, I can promise you. It wouldn't be living in my house, even though it's mean. 
nor are those the original dogs. And so with that, I'm going to end because we've run out of time. I'll get to the last couple points as we jump in to the, and continue the flood. Is there any questions up to this point about this event, the flood? Any questions? Y'all got it all test tomorrow. Y'all re ready? All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to come and to continue to read and to study your word together. Father, I just ask that you help us to, to take this knowledge and use it for what you desire for it to do, which is to grow our faith, that we, like Noah, will be faithful to do what you have commanded us to do. Father, we live in a world that we know the judgment's coming. Will you help us to be faithful? Will you help us to not get lost in the things of this world? But you too would find us and you would say that at least we seek your face, that we would be considered worthy enough. Father, help us. Help us to be faithful to the commands you've given us, to be the very light and the salt that you desire for us to be for our own families. Just as Noah, through reverence, prepared the ark for the salvation of his household, help us, Father, to be willing to work diligently for the salvation of ours. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.